Chapter 13, Southern Sudan, 2009. Naya thought it was funny. You had to have water to find water. Water had to be flowing constantly into the borehole to keep the drill running smoothly. The crew drove to the pond and back several times a day. The pond water was piped into what looked like a giant plastic bag, a bag big enough to fill the entire bed of the truck. The bag sprang a leak. The leak had to be patched. The patch sprang a leak. The crew had to patch the patch. Then the bag sprang another leak. The drilling could not go on. The drilling crew was discouraged by the leaks. They wanted to stop working, but their boss kept them going. All the workers wore the same blue coveralls. Still, Nye could tell who was the boss. He was one of the two men who had first come to the village. The other man seemed to be his main assistant. The boss would encourage the workers and laugh and joke with them. If that didn't work, he would talk to them earnestly and try to persuade them. And if that didn't work, he would get angry. He didn't get angry very often. He kept working and kept the others working too. They patched the bag again. The drilling went on. Ethiopia, Sudan, Kenya, 1991 to 1992. Hundreds of people lined the riverbank. The soldiers were forcing some of them into the water, prodding them with their rifle butts, shooting into the air. Other people, afraid of the soldiers and their guns, were leaping into the water on their own. They were immediately swept downstream by the powerful current. Asalva crouched on the bank and watched. A young man near him plunged into the water. The current carried him swiftly downstream, but he was also making a, li a little progress across the river. Then, Salva saw the telltale flick of a crocodile's tail as it flopped into the water near the young man. Moments later, the man's head jerked oddly, once, twice. His mouth was open. Perhaps he was screaming, but Salva could not hear him over the din of the crowd and the rain. A moment later, the man was pulled under. A cloud of red stained the water. The rain was still pouring down, and now bullets were pouring down as well. The soldiers started shooting into the river, aiming their guns at the people who were trying to get across. Why? Why are they shooting at us? Salva had no choice. He jumped into the water and began to swim. A boy next to him grabbed him around the neck and clung to him tightly. Salva was forced under the surface without time to take more than a quick, shallow breath. Salva struggled, kicking, clawing. He's holding onto me too hard. It can't. Air. No air left. Suddenly, the boy's grip loosened and Salva launched himself upward. He threw his head back and took a huge gulp of air. For a few moments, he could do nothing but gasp and choke. When his vision cleared... He saw why the boy had let go. He was floating with his head down, blood streaming from a bullet hole in the back of his neck. Stunned, Salva realized that being forced under the water had probably saved his life. But there is no time to marvel over this. More crocodiles were launching themselves off the banks. The rain, the mad current, the bullets, the crocodiles, the welter of arms and legs, the screams, the blood. He had to get across somehow. Salva did not know how long he was in the water. It felt like hours. It felt like years. When at last the tips of his toes touched mud, he forced his limbs to make swimming motions one last time. He crawled onto the riverbank and collapsed. Then he lay there in the mud, choking and sobbing for breath. Later, he would learn that at least a thousand people had died trying to cross the river that day, drowned or shot were attacked by crocodiles. How was it that he was not one of the thousand? Why was he one of the lucky ones? The walking began again. Walking, but to where? No one knew anything for sure. Where was Salva supposed to go? Not home. There's still war everywhere in Sudan. Not back to Ethiopia. The soldiers would shoot us. Kenya. There are supposed to be refugee camps in Kenya. Salva made up his mind. He would walk south to Kenya. He did not know what he would find once he got there, but it seemed to be his best choice. Crowds of other boys followed him. 
Nobody talked about it, but by the end of the first day, Selva had become the leader of a group of about 1,500 boys. Some were as young as five years old. Those smallest boys reminded Selva of his brother Kuo. But then he had an astounding thought. Kuo isn't that age anymore. He's a teenager now. Selva found that he could only think of his brothers and sisters as they were when he had last seen them, not as they would be now. They were traveling through a part of Sedan still plagued by war. The fighting and bombing were worse during the day, so Selva decided that the group should hide when the sun shone and do their walking at night. But in the darkness, it was hard to be sure they were headed in the right direction. Sometimes the boys traveled for days, only to realize that they had gone in a huge circle. This happened so many times that Selva lost count. They met other groups of boys, all walking south. Every group had stories of terrible peril. Boys who had been hurt or killed by bullets or bombs, attacked by wild animals, or left behind because they were too weak or sick to keep up. When Selva heard the stories, he thought of Mario. He felt his determination growing, as it had in the days after Uncle's death. I will get us safely to Kenya, he thought, no matter how hard it is. He organized the group, giving everyone a job. Scavenge for food, collect firewood, stand guard while the group slept. Whatever food or water they found was shared equally among all of them. When the smaller boys grew too tired to walk, the older boys took turns carrying them on their backs. There were times when some of the boys did not want to do their share of the work. Salva would talk to them, encourage them, and coax and persuade them. Once in a while, he had to speak sternly or even shout, but he tried not to do this too often. It was as if Selva's family were helping him, even though they were not there. He remembered how he had looked after his little brother, Kuo, but he also knew what it felt like to have to listen to the older ones, Eric and Ring, and he could recall the gentleness of his sisters, the strength of his father, the care of his mother. Most of all, he remembered how Uncle had encouraged him in the desert. One step at a time, one day at a time, just today, just this day to get through. Salva told him that Salva told himself this every day. He told the boys in the group at two. And one day at a time, the group made its way to Kenya. More than twelve hundred boys arrived safely. It took them a year and a half. Chapter fourteen. Southern Sudan, 2009. For three days, the air around Naya's home was filled with the sound of the drill. On the third afternoon, Naya joined the other children gathered around the drill site. The grown-ups rose from their work, pounding rocks, and drifted over too. The workers seemed excited. They were moving quickly as their leader called out orders. Then, whoosh! A spray of water shot high into the air. This wasn't the water that the workers had been piping into the borehole. This was new water, water that was coming out of the hole. Everyone cheered at the sight of the water. They all laughed at the sight of the two workers who had been operating the drill. They were drenched, their clothes completely soaked through. A woman in the crowd began singing a song of celebration. Naya clapped her hands along with all the other children. But as Naya watched the water spraying out of the borehole, she frowned. The water wasn't clear. It was brown and muddy and heavy looking. It was full of mud. Ifo Refugee Camp, Kenya, 1992-1996 to Selva was now 22 years old. For the past five years, he had been living in refugee camps in northern Kenya. First, at Kakuma Camp, then at Ifo. Kakuma had been a dreadful place, isolated in the middle of a dry, windy desert. Tall fences of barbed wire enclosed the camp. You weren't allowed to leave unless you were leaving for good. It felt almost like a prison. 70,000 people lived at Kakuma. Some said it was more, 80 or 90,000. There were families who had managed to escape together, but again, as in Ethiopia, most of the refugees were orphaned boys and young men. 
The local people who lived in the area did not like having the refugee camp nearby. They would often sneak in and steal from the refugees. Sometimes fights broke out and people were hurt or killed. After two years of misery at Kakuma, Selva decided to leave the camp. He had heard of another refugee camp far to the south and west, where he hoped things would be better. Once again, Selva and a few other young men walked for months. When they reached the camp at Ifo, they found that things were no different than at Kakuma. Everyone was always hungry, and there was never enough food. Many were sick or had gotten injured during their long, terrible journeys to reach the camp. The few medical volunteers could not care for everyone who needed help. Selva felt fortunate that at least he was in good health. He wanted desperately to work, to make a little money that he could use to buy extra food. He even dreamed of saving some money so that one day he could leave the camp and continue his education somehow. But there is no work. There is nothing to do but wait. Wait for the next meal, for news of the world outside the camp. The days were long and empty. They stretched into weeks, then months, then years. It was hard to keep hope alive when there was so little to feed it. Michael was an aid worker from a country called Ireland. Selva had met a lot of aid workers. They came and went, staying at the camp for several weeks, or at most a few months. The aid workers came from many different countries, but they usually spoke English to each other. Few of the refugees spoke English, so communication with the aid workers was often difficult. But after so many years in the camp, Selva could understand a little English. He even tried to speak it once in a while, and Michael almost always seemed to understand what Selva was trying to say. One day, after the morning meal, Michael spoke to Selva. You seem interested in learning English, he said. How would you like to learn to read? The lessons began that very day. Michael wrote down three letters on a small scrap of paper. A, B, C, he said, handing the scrap to Selva. A, B, C, Selva repeated. The whole rest of the day, Selva went around saying A, B, C, mostly to himself, but sometimes aloud, in a quiet voice. He looked at the paper a hundred times and practiced drawing the letters in the dirt with a stick over and over again. Selva remembered learning to read Arabic when he was young. The Arabic alphabet had 28 letters, the English only 26. In English, the letters stayed separate from each other, so it was easy to tell them apart. In Arabic words, the letters were always joined, and a letter might look different depending on what came before or after it. Sure, you're doing lovely, Michael said, the day Selva learned to write his own name. You learn fast because you work so hard. Selva did not say what he was thinking, that he was working hard because he wanted to learn to read English before Michael had left the camp. Selva did not know if any of the other aid workers would take the time to teach him. But once in a while, it's good to take a break from work. Let's do something a wee bit different for a change. I'm thinking you'll be good at this. You're a tall lad. So Selva learned two things from Michael. How to read and how to play volleyball. A rumor was spreading through the camp. It began as a whisper, but soon Selva felt as if it were a roar in his ears. He could think of nothing else. America. The United States. The rumor was that about 3,000 boys and young men from the refugee camps would be chosen to go live in America. Selva could not believe it. How could it be true? How would they get there? Where would they live? Surely it was impossible. But as the days went by, the aid workers confirmed the news. It was all anyone could talk about. They only want healthy people. If you are sick, you won't be chosen. They won't take you if you have ever been a soldier with the rebels. Only orphans are being chosen. If you have any family left, you have to stay here. Weeks passed, then months. One day, a notice was posted at the camp's administration tent. It was a list of names. If your name was on the list, it meant that you had made it to the next step, the interview. After the interview, you might go to America. Salva's name was not on the list nor was it on the next list or the one after that. 
Many of the boys being chosen were younger than Selva. Perhaps America doesn't want anyone too old, he thought. Each time a list was posted, Selva's heart would pound as he read the names. He tried not to lose hope. At the same time, he tried not to hope too much. Sometimes he felt he was being torn in two by the hoping and the not hoping. One windy afternoon, Michael rushed over to Selva's tent. Selva, come quickly. Your name is on the list today. Selva leapt to his feet and was running even before his friend had finished speaking. When he drew near the administration tent, he slowed down and tried to catch his breath. He might be wrong. It might be another person named Selva. I won't look too soon. From far away, I might see a name that looks like mine, and I need to be sure. Selva shouldered his way through the crowd until he was standing in front of the list. He raised his head slowly and began reading through the names. There it was. Selva Dute, Rochester, New York. Selva was going to New York. He was going to America. <laughs>